Vă invit cu respect să ne ridicăm. Aș vrea să citesc un verset și jumătate, Psalmul 31, versetul 14 și prima parte versetului 15. Psalm 31, starting with verse 14. Și pentru că mesajul meu în această dimineață va fi în limba engleză, voi citi uh, textul acesta în limba engleză. Și este o declarație. But I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Până aici cuvântul Domnului, vă invit să reocupați locurile. Um, This is the fourth and final message in the series on waiting. And uh, in a way, I'm happy that I'm able to speak at least part of this message in English. Not that our young ones don't understand Romanian. They do, just not fully. And uh, I'm happy to, be ha to have this opportunity to be able to uh, bring this message in English. Now, I'm aware that most of us uh, are in a season of waiting. For others, for some, it's really pressing. For others, it's kind of pressing. And if one thing is certain as children of God, we're going to go through seasons of waiting. I must say that um, the hardest period of waiting lasted about nine years. It was years ago. And as I look back on that time, uh, every day was hard out of nine years. It didn't feel like I ever had a break. It wasn't where, you know, a week passed by and then I, I thought, oh, right, I'm waiting. It was an everyday thing. And I know that some of you are going through a period like that where every day you are reminded, I am waiting. And one day is not easier than the other. And uh, I must qualify the statement to say that um, Violeta and I, for those watching online, Violeta is my wife, um, just like many of you, got together before the Lord and we gave the Lord every single aspect of our lives. We had a moment where we said, Lord, we don't know exactly. We have some ideas about what you want to do with us. But here we are with our lives, with everything you've given us. And Lord, we, we're putting it on the altar. We want to fulfill your plan and your purpose for our lives. And it was done conscientiously aware and very sincere in a very sincere way. And you would think that if you give your life to God completely, and if you give God control of every aspect of your life, that somehow, as you wait, that would make it easier. You know what? It wasn't. It wasn't any easier at all. It was hard. Waiting is hard. And in that period of waiting, uh, Violeta bought me a coffee mug. We have many coffee mugs, but she bought me a coffee mug with a Bible verse on it. And if you're holding it in your left hand, it's staring at you. If you're holding it in your right hand, it's staring at you. As you finish your coffee in the morning, at the bottom of the cup, that verse is there. So it was a daily reminder. What was that Bible verse? Exactly what I read this morning. It said, but I... Trust in you, Lord. You are my God. My times are in your hands. In other words, the fulfillment for your promises. The timing for the things that you want to give me. I don't have control of those things. Lord, they're in your hands. And every day as I would drink my coffee in the morning, I was reminded of that. Now, in that period, uh, one of my nephews came to live with us. He got accepted to dental school and in the city that we were in, so he came to live with us for a couple years. And one morning, I noticed he was holding my cup, my mug with this verse. And I said, Timmy, you can drink out of any mug that we have in this house. That mug is the exception. You cannot drink out of that mug. <laughs> that is my daily reminder that my times are in God's hands. So as I speak on the subject, I by no means want to demean how hard it is for you in this period of waiting. I don't want to trivialize it. I don't want to make it sound like, you know, to talk about it in a flippant way, like it's something easy, get on board, get on with it, without compassion. Trust me, 
I have been through a season of waiting that was crushing. And even right now, we're in a season of waiting. As a church, we're in a season of waiting. Yes, God has done many things, but we're still in a season of waiting. And the reality is, is that every single true man or woman of God is going to have to go through a season of waiting. Waiting is important. Waiting does something in our lives. And we talked about that in the first message that we had. It's like we have promises. Let's imagine you're a mathematician and you want to get to calculus, to the heavy stuff. But you need to do basic arithmetic and you need to know your algebra. We want God's plan for our lives. We want the promises that he has, but he's saying we need to work on the algebra. And guess where that class is? In the waiting. Every great man or woman of God had to go through a season of waiting. Abraham had to go through a season of waiting. Sarah, his wife, had to go through a season of waiting. Joseph had the promises. He had to go through a season of waiting. Moses felt the calling in his heart. He had to go through a season of waiting. Jesus had to wait 30 years to enter into his ministry. The apostles had to go through a season of waiting. The apostle Paul had to wait in Arabia. A season of waiting. And there's no exception for myself or for you. So the first thing that I want to say this morning is that Waiting brings us into harmony with God. Waiting brings us into harmony with God. And waiting brings us relationally into harmony with God. We talked about it last time how Abraham and Sarah's impatience interrupted that relationship with God where they stopped hearing from God. There is a period of silence caused by impatience, by disobedience in a certain way. If there is something that brought them back, that synchronized them with God, where they were in harmony with God, it was a season of waiting of 13 years. And after 13 years, Abraham and Sarah hear God's voice again. And what a relief that must have been. So if impatience gets us, gets us out of sync with God, then waiting is the instrument that gets us back into harmony with God. And think about the statement that I read from the Bible this morning. And notice that this is a personal statement. It starts with I. This is something that we, each one of us, have to declare over our lives, in our lives, in our family, in our church. It says, but I trust in you. Notice, it's not my grandparents trusted in you. My parents trust you. Lord, the leadership of the church trusts you. No. There's a declaration that you're going to have to make that's about you and your life. And you're going to have to say, but I, I know that the leadership trusts. I know my parents trust God, but Lord, here's my decision. I choose to trust in you, but I trust in you, Lord. And then there's a declaration. It's a personal statement. I say, you are my God. Do you know that you have to choose God as your God? Yes, he is God, whether you like it or not. It just is. It's a fact. But whether he is your God, that's a different matter. And notice that you need a personal statement to say, Lord, I declare you are my God. Not just my parents' God, not just my grandparents. No, Lord, you are my God. And therefore, the natural expression of the fact that I trust him and that he is my God, therefore, my times are in your hands. And this is a hard one. To come to the Lord and to say, Lord, the time for fulfillment, for your promises, and for what you want to do in my life, I give up control of those things. Lord, the fulfillment, my time, my times, because there's multiple fulfillments, are in your hands. Listen, if you truly trust the Lord, if he truly is your God, the natural expression of that trust and of the fact that he is your God is that your times will be left in his hands. And that's a hard one. Because in reality, waiting requires you to let go of control. We want to make things happen. You see, impatience is a symptom of a deeper reality. When we are faced with impatience in our lives, it just proves that the statements that we made aren't truly true. 
that theoretically we accept those, but not practically. Where God is God, he's in control, and times are in his hands. But on the other hand, the discipline of waiting is the process where we learn to let go of control. Where we let God be God in our lives. I don't know if you've noticed how inconsistent the counsel of the flesh is in our lives. And when I say the flesh, I mean our mind, our will, and our emotions. Our mind is constantly speaking. Our will wants certain things. Our emotions are crying out for things all the time. And if we look in the Bible, the counsel of the flesh is really represented by Sarah in the story of Abraham and Sarah. And this is how the flesh usually speaks in our lives. And Sarah comes to Abraham, right? They, they have a problem, right? They don't have a child. They've been waiting for many years. And here's the counsel of the flesh to solve the problem. Impatience, wanting to make things happen. And she tells Abraham, Abraham, listen to me. Focus on what I am saying. Not necessarily on what God is saying. We're not talking about God. Listen to me. And she tells him, resolve your problem. Take my servant, you know, uh, a Hagar, and, and have a child with her. That's the counsel of the flesh. And you would think, okay, that's the counsel of the flesh. But notice how inconsistent it is. Later on, they have Ishmael and they have their own son. And Sarah comes back to Abram and says, get rid of the child. You can see the voice or the counsel of the flesh by the impulses of what it's telling you to do. One moment it's telling you, you need to do this. Listen to me. Listen to the emotions. Listen to the desires inside. The very next moment, get rid of that. It's no good. There's an inconsistency. Have you ever had the counsel of the flesh in your life? I have. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen it in the life of others. You know, impulse that says, marry that man, marry that girl. There's something in your conscience saying, there's something wrong here, but the counsel of the flesh, do it now, listen to me. And they go ahead and they get married. And it's not the time or the place or the person. A little while later, the counsel of the flesh comes back again. Get rid of this person. They're not for you. I rem I'm reminded of a story, true story, of a pastor who had to deal, deal with a sister in church. And um, she had her husband, he was on his dying bed. He was terminally ill. He was waiting to die. And she came to the pastor. She wanted to get married. She had already found the guy that she was going to get married with. And, and the pastor, whom I know personally, said, um, Sister, just wait a couple of days for crying out loud. He's dying. What's the hurry? Oh, the Lord spoke to me. This is the man. You know, she didn't wait. She went ahead and got married against Scripture, against the Word of God, the counsel of the flesh. Sure enough, her first husband died within a few days after she got married. Not long afterwards, she comes back to leadership saying, oh, this person is terrible, and, and look at what he does, and I need permission to divorce him. Notice the inconsistency of the counsel of the flesh. If you want to hear from God, you have to get used to the discipline of waiting in your life. What is the problem? with the flesh. It causes impatience in us. Impatience causes us to do things that will take us out of harmony with God. And when we're out of harmony with God, we're led straight into deception. Impatience leads to being out of harmony with God. When you're out of harmony with God, you're in deception. You think you're hearing from God. You have emotions. You think it's Him, but it's really not. But waiting is the discipline that brings us back into harmony with God. Secondly, waiting brings us back into harmony with God's plan for our lives. First, he brings us relations. Waiting brings us relationally back into harmony with God himself. Once we're into harmony with God relationally, waiting also does something else. It brings us into harmony with God's plan, with the things that he has for us. Abraham and Sarah waited. They got back into relationship, proper relationship with God. But they were also brought back to the plan of God, which was having a son through Sarah, which was Isaac. One of the commonest mistakes that I find that we as Christians make is we only focus on one aspect 
of, of things or aspects in our lives where we're focused on whether something is right or wrong. We're like, is this right or is it wrong? And sometimes it's not that simple. It's not whether it's right or wrong. We're interested, is this a sin or is it not a sin? And the reality is that there's one more component that makes it right or wrong. There's more, one more element to this equation that we have to take into consideration, and that is the time element. God's plan and His will must be also be done in God's timing. And imagine, right, we're going to have the brass band after my message play here. And they all have a sheet of music. Everyone's playing from the same sheet of music. Obviously, they have different parts to play. And imagine that you're a great musician. You can hit every note, perfect pitch, or you sing in the choir, right? And Nukens Faltz, right? You, you're right there. Your voice is excellent. It sounds great. Or in the orchestra or whatever it may be. But imagine that you're a good musician, you're on pitch, you do everything right, but your timing is off. Imagine that everybody but one starts on time and somebody else starts two seconds later and sings their part perfectly, but just two seconds late. I guarantee you the whole thing is going to fall apart. Same thing in a choir, same thing in an, in an orchestra. The moral of the story is, if you do the right thing at the wrong time, you've ruined it. And this is a hard one for most of us. And this is where most sincere Christians mess up. They want a relationship, for example, young people, with a good person. The problem, at the wrong time. And you've ruined it. it. That may be the very person that God intends you to be with. But if you start their relationship at the wrong time, you've messed it up. Another example, with serving brothers and sisters who have a calling from God, who are gifted, but they're impatient to start their ministry. And they just will work like nobody's business to start at something that is God's calling for their life, but they just do it at the wrong time. And it's true for singers, for preachers, for pastors, for evangelists. You know what they all produce? An Ishmael. You cannot say that something is right or correct based on the action itself. It's only right or correct when it's done at the right time when it's done in God's timing. You may have the right sheet of music. You may have the right plan of God for your life. But if you're trying to fulfill that at your own initiative, in your own timing, without the conductor's timing, you couldn't be more wrong. There are many people who miss God's plan, the fulfillment of God in their lives for a single reason, impatience. They just can't wait. So they move on with their own initiative. In reality, there isn't a single aspect of our lives that doesn't require God's timing. Not a single thing. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Here's what the Word of God says. For how many things there is a time? It says, there is a time for everything. How many things does everything include? Every single thing. And it says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And then it gives a group of things. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, and a time to give up, a time to give, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. And then in verse 11, it says that he, and that is God, he has made everything beautiful when? Only in its time. So notice, it's not just that something is right or wrong. It first has to be right. It has to be God's plan. But secondly, it's only right when it's fulfilled exactly in God's timing. It says in Amos chapter 3 with verse 3, Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? 
Who are the two here? It's us and God. Can we walk with God unless we agree to walk with God and God agrees to walk with us? The reality is we cannot claim that we're walking with God if we're not in step, in sync with God. You can't be ahead of God and you can't be behind him. You have to be exactly in time, in lockstep with him. If we do indeed walk with him, he is the one dictating how, when, the speed, the step that we're walking with. Galatians chapter 4 with verse 4 says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son. When did Jesus come? Exactly at the set time. Not a second before, not a second after. Ephesians chapter 1 with verse 9. It says that he, and it's talking about God, made known to us the mystery of his will. Okay, he has a will. According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when? When the times reach their fulfillment. Notice God has a plan. He has a purpose. But it's to be activated when the times reach their fulfillment. God has a plan for your life. But he doesn't just have a plan. He has a timing. And it's supposed to be fulfilled in that timing. Therefore, waiting is what brings our lives into harmony with God's plan for our lives. And thirdly, waiting is a distinctive mark of God's people. If there's something that characterizes someone as a true Christian, it's waiting. Here's what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 with verse 8. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to do what? And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Notice, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is saying that these Christians are true Christians. They're authentic Christians. And then the Holy Spirit really highlights the two things that really characterize these people as true and authentic Christians. They're Christians who are serving. They're serving God by serving people. They're being active. And secondly, those Christians are waiting there are, Christ, there are people who are waiting. And God's definition for authentic Christians has not changed. An authentic Christian is one who is serving God right now. An authentic Christian is a person who is waiting for God right now. Both of these things are true in their lives. And while we're serving and waiting, this says something about us. It says that we live, but we don't live for ourselves. We live for God. It tells the world around us that we're looking for something that surpasses our human ability. We're looking to God for answers. It tells the world we're acknowledging, we're longing for something that is higher than this earthly plane. And our waiting really gives hope to the world around us that we have a hope for the future. Most people are very pessimistic today. You know, they're worried about global warming. They're worried about overpopulation. They're worried about war. They're worried about politics. They're worried about the economy. You know, the only Christians who are waiting for Jesus have a hope for something good in the future. Everyone, their picture is very bleak. But when they see us waiting, they're like, what are you waiting for? I'm waiting for Jesus. We have a hope. We know how the story ends. We read the back of the book. This is going to end up good. Yes, I may be going through trials right now. But something good is about to happen in conclusion. God is coming for a single category of people. You guessed it. Those who wait. It says in Hebrew chapter 9 with verse 27. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation for whom? To those who are waiting for him. The word salvation here doesn't just mean salvation for eternity. Yes, it means that. The word salvation is all-inclusive. It includes your need for tomorrow. 
It includes your need for your family, for your children, for your finances. It includes the needs of our church here. And salvation is coming for a single category of people. Those who are waiting for him. And then I would just want to ask one more question. I realize that most of us here trust God in the waiting. We trust God in the sense that, Lord, we trust that you're going to come to give me something, to bring a solution to my problem, to give me something. We trust God with the giving. But my question is, do you trust God with the taking? There are times where God reaches with his hand in our lives and takes something out. And there are people that trust God, Lord, to give me things. But when it comes to God taking something out, we stop short of that. If he truly is your God, we must trust him not in the giving, but also in the process of when he takes something away. And I heard something once that I hold true in my own life. If God decides to take something out of my life, it's only because he wants to give me something greater, never something less. God will never give anyone a bad deal. And I pray that every one of us here will trust God in the giving and will trust God in the taking because he both gives and takes. And we, like Job, must say, God gave, blessed be his name. God took, blessed be his name. Whether he's giving or taking, I bless his name at all times. And the last thing is that waiting produces supernatural results in our lives. As Abraham and Sarah waited, there was supernatural transformation that took place in their lives, in their bodies. This is true not just for Abraham and Sarah, but for every person who's waiting. Something is happening in you that you are not perceiving. And what is happening is a supernatural transformation. And I pray that God will give us the grace for all of us to qualify ourselves to the supernatural transformation by waiting. Amen.